All right, now, everybody. Quiet, listen to me. We're going to start a show. Now, some of you people have been with me before. You know it's going to be a tough grind. But we're going to have a show. And I am in for Mark Thompson once again. Um, Mark has to, I think he has to take his dad to the doctor today. So he will slide back into the captain's chair tomorrow. But today it's me and it's Albert. Good morning to you. Good morning. Yeah. The, you know, keeping Mark in our thoughts and his yeah. dad all, as well as he's mm-hmm. uh, doing his job, you know, not, well, not really job, just doing his, you know, it, it's family first here on the Absolutely. Mark Thompson show. As, and as it should be, right? So we're holding the, down the fort and uh, let's, what other cliche is keeping the home fires burning. We're doing it all. We're doing it all here on the Mark Thompson show. And thank you for being here. Here's what we have coming up for today. We have Mark's Murder Mystery Monday. The girls will get together. It's me and Courtney we're talking about murder today. So we'll do that. And Pulitzer Prize winning um, business columnist for the LA Times, it's Michael Hiltzik. So we'll talk to him. He's written some really interesting articles recently and we'll talk about that and we will then get to something going on in Tennessee where they've decided to ban all drag performances on public property like libraries we saw what happened here in the Bay Area so we'll have the owner of the largest drag club in the country, San Francisco's Oasis, here on the show to talk about that, what that means, the sentiment behind it, and uh, and the like. Yeah. So it's going to be a great show. I'm really excited. I, You know what? I just got a picture that I want to add to the mix. Laura sent me this picture of Hale in San Jose. So let me see if I can save it really quick. I'm going to say Hale. Um, but I wanted to start off with some weather because... We have uh, had some snow. We've got a lot of people still days and days and days now. They've been snowed in, snowed in in Southern California. Let me see if I can't. Oh, is it hail? I don't we know. We haven't quite been getting snow. Some of our, I, I live close to Mission Peak in Fremont. I'm in Union yeah. City, but on Saturday night, well, I guess technically Sunday morning, it yeah. was like a three minute span of just straight hail that woke me up like at 3 a.m this must have been what they were going and doing in san jose and i can't get the picture up for you guys i'm sorry but laura just sent it i wanted to show it's it's uh, her backyard and hail falling in san jose so you can always send me pictures of your weather phenomenon at kim mccallister at gmail.com two m's two c's and two l's on that uh so let's get some pictures up here of what's been happening because first of all i mean this is southern california look at the hollywood sign with the snow behind it snow covered peaks this is just amazing what's happening in southern california uh and i think it's amazing there's a lot of people who are just absolutely done right because they've been snowed in for quite a while, 10 feet of snow in some areas, and they could be trapped for another week without, you know, fresh food deliveries and things that they need. There are thousands of people since February 28th that have been stranded in the snow in the San Bernardino, uh, San Bernardino Mountains. Of course, that's just east of Los Angeles. And this is something where you know, that you can't get into this area. And it's frustrating for people. There are snow plows everywhere. Uh, The San Bernardino County Sheriff is saying to people, look, we'll have relief to you shortly, but I don't have exact times. And I just, it can't, it's not possible to give you exact times because we're trying to dig you out of the snow. As a matter of fact, Governor Gavin Newsom's got a state of emergency in 13 counties because of all this. In some cases, roofs are collapsing because of the heavy weight of all the snow i don't know in california are the is things built to withstand this much snow there was a grocery store in this one town it's a mountain resort town called crestline and they were trying to get supplies out to people but their building collapsed under several feet of snow as well so it could take up to two weeks to rescue everyone kind of a scary situation you know i it's funny because we're so in California, it seems like so uh, 
most of us don't get snow very often. So when it happens, it's kind of like, ooh, snow day exciting, right? And then you see what happens to people that are just stuck for weeks and weeks and weeks. This is in uh, also Southern California. You can see them trying to dig people out. Pretty horrible. For people here in Northern California, it hasn't been easy either. This is a Truckee area or a Tahoe area. This is a picture of Truckee. A UPS guy trying to deliver a package in Truckee through the snow. Oh, man, that's got to be a hard job right now. But that's what it is. And uh, according to SF Gate, it took a really long time to drive from the Homewood Ski Resort back to San Francisco. I think they're saying well over five hours. There have been road closures. And we are get due in for apparently another atmospheric river is on the way in next week. Uh, so the storms are not over. We're still being inundated. And I guess it's a good thing because we've got uh, a dent in the drought finally. But yeah, man. we wanted we wanted <laughs> rain. We needed rain. And we, we got a lot more than we asked for. <laughs> Careful what you wish for snow. situation. Yeah. I, I mean, really, you know, it's uh, it's been OK, kind of enough now. Almost maybe. Do you think we're done? Yeah, yeah, we they, wanted it. Well, we didn't want that much, but <laughs> but what what can we do, you know? And and uh, fortunately, we've been using that as an excuse to have Mark's yeah. great friend, someone who took his job at Great Good Morning America, Spencer Christian, right? And we'll be having him on later this week. Excellent. Uh, yesterday, this SF Gate article says from what is it? Colfax, uh, Nevada State Line. Colfax uh, was closed. Also, Interstate 80 was closed. Hopefully, they're getting things open. But it was more than a five and a half hours drive, they said, from Homewood to San Francisco. Usually, that takes just a little more than three hours. Uh, CHP Truckee saying, travel highly discouraged. Roads are extremely treacherous, again. So, uh, yeah, I don't know. Uh, and here we are with more storm warnings in, a pla in place and blowing and drifting snow, making for zero visibility. It's something. It's something for sure. I'm sure all the snow the snow sports people were really excited to see all the rain and all the snow, but also I'm sure they're also like, whoa, this is a little too much. I can't even get to my destination here. Okay, so let's go. Let's leave the snow in the past and go straight to vacation. I don't know if you saw this story, but I'm I'm hoping that uh you will tell me in the chat how much you think uh this couple should sue for <laughs> because this is wild. Okay. This couple, they're chemists, they're Stanford graduates, and they get married, and they go on this amazing honeymoon to Hawaii, and they go to uh, on a snorkel trip, a snorkel boat, and they go to this place called Club Lanai. I've actually been there. It's a stretch of beach on Lanai. You can only get there by boat. It's got like a massive checkerboard and a little bar and a beach, and that's it. And then they take them further out. It's a snorkel trip. There's like 44 people in the water. And all of a sudden, the couple looks up and the boat's driving away. What? <laughs> yes, the boat's leaving them in the dust. It's like something from a movie, right? Uh-oh, you're in open ocean. The boat just drove away. There you are, There's bobbing up and down in the water. Like oh, I'll tell you. They try, they're in shape, they're young. They try to swim after the boat, but the boat's gone. It's That's it. So it turns out someone, another uh, snorkeler, got aboard the boat and told the people, hey, there's still a couple up back out there. Don't leave yet. And the That's guy checking fake. everybody in That's real. said, hey, everybody's accounted for. Off we go to the next dive site. And they left these people behind. In the end, they managed to swim back to Club Lanai. It was frightening. Uh, they didn't know if they were going to make it. They did. They're okay. That was two years ago. You know, they and do now this to me all the time. I don't know what the hell they do it for. <laughs> now they're filing suit. How much do you think they're suing for, Albert? I don't know, but that was a simple headcount thing. You know, I worked at yeah. summer camps growing up, and uh, all you got to do is count the people before you get that boat <laughs> out, and you would have saved, I'm sure, a lot of money, and you're asking how much yeah. did, did they sue for? Uh-huh. How much is that worth? That panic when, like, you're there in the ocean. You know, you're thinking of that movie where the sharks come eat you. Sharks and you got to swim back. I can't even swim, Kim. This sounds like a very terrible time to me already. Choppy water, waves up to eight feet high. And there they are sitting there in the ocean with nothing but snorkels on their face and swimsuits. <laughs> oh, my gosh. <laughs> 
Uh, well, we're getting some. We, we got some guesses in the millions right here. Fifteen. I'll go like a solid, like five million dollars. Five okay. million dollars. And th- and you would be right. And it's funny. That's what Mark said too. Five million. That's what they're suing for. I think this is a twenty million dollar case. Because if I'm I'm not a, I've never sued anyone in my life. But I'll tell you, if I'm left in the dust, that is crazy that is so scary yeah it's uh it, it's they're suing for five mil five million dollars absolutely well, five well, million five million in damages and they're looking for a jury trial to get that money so uh the lawsuit says the coast guard investigation into this incident found the vessel master negligently performed duties with regard to operating the vessel he did not uphold the company's safety procedures i guess that has to do with the head count and uh yeah, five million. That's what they want. I think they should get more. I just I, I think they should because like... those were their lives on on the line. And if they weren't capable of swimming that distance, then who would have mm-hmm. known what they would have just disappeared and no money and no and that's their life just because this guy just left them back. Yeah, and then the crazy part about that is the guy was told that they were still out there. And and even then they're like, Yeah, 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 everybody's here. It's fine. Go on. I don't know. Uh, so stick close to the boat if you're going on a snorkeling trip. Has the, the uh, moral of that story. You know, this is really sad news that I found out over the weekend. Actually, it's kind of news that's a long time coming. Did you hear that the Conways are getting divorced? Kellyanne well, and George Conway. Kellyanne and George Conway. I did see that. And, yeah. You know, they've been uh, they've been in the media in the forefront for a while. So. Mm-hmm. Um, so they have four kids. Sadly, uh, not sadly that they have kids, but sadly, the kids will have to go through the divorce. <clears throat> and uh, it's it's one of those things where you think f- to yourself, if they're so politically misaligned, he was, I guess, a, uh, a Republican, but not Trumpy. And she, of course, Trumpy. And they have just gone back and forth in the press with her husband, George Conway, speaking badly about former President Trump when she works for former President Trump, right? So it's been kind of one of those things where you think, how long is this marriage going to last? It lasted a lot longer than I thought it would, to be honest. And of course... But that doesn't mean that it's a good thing. uh, Here's her quote. I already said publicly what I'd said privately to George, that his daily deluge of insults by tweet against my boss, or as he put it, as he put it sometimes, the people in the White House, violated our marriage vows to love, honor, and cherish each other. It seemed the flood of reaction and attention he was receiving was magnetic and irresistible. So that I mean, it's kind of relatable. I'm sure yeah. with any spouse, you, you don't they don't always have to be the best fans of your coworkers, but playing it out in the media and in front of millions of people, it's it's a little different to set put your set your your set up uh, yeah put your differences aside. So yeah, yeah, uh, that's a know. pretty pr- public disagreement. Of course, uh, the former president Trump had to get involved in the whole uh, divorce announcement. He said, congratulations to Kellyanne Conway on her divorce from her wacko husband, Mr. Kellyanne Conway. Free at last. She's finally gotten rid of the disgusting albatross around her neck. There's never been anything like this. She'll now be free to lead the kind of life she deserves, and it'll be a great life without the extremely unattractive loser by her side. Okay. He has a way with words, Ken. That was was truly beautiful. (laughs) I mean, you know, maybe this isn't doesn't really involve you, former President Trump. Maybe you should, uh, and that really re- uh, kind of prompted a response from George Conway. He said, "Hey, looking forward to seeing you in New York at E. Jean's trial next month. Hugs and kisses." <laughs> That's the uh, the rape defamation trial the former president is uh, is dealing with in the New York area. So yeah. So a lot of back and forth with the the Conway is on the divorce. And, uh, you know, I just feel bad for their kids. Of course, remember their daughter came out publicly and there was all kinds of trouble, not came out, came out, but uh, emerged from the shadows uh, trying to get away from her parents. It's what a mess. I'm yeah, she was you. having some troubles in, in school or just in like on a day to day basis. Yeah. Yeah. It's messy. Uh, did you see the story about the BART ride? It's an SF gate. There's a Bay Area software engineer who was charged 
$545 for a single BART ride. Oops. Yeah. So uh, this is the morning commute for Malik. What? Gudaguntla. <clears throat> he went from Oakland to South Fremont. Well, not that, you know, short. Is whatever. It's kind of a normal commute. But for some reason, his digital clipper card wasn't working. He held his phone up to several different turnstiles, apparently, at two different parts of the, the BART station uh, and couldn't get in. He goes to a BART attendant. They eventually let him through. But apparently, looking back at the Google wallet, he saw all these transactions. So maybe it was registering every single time. And it looks like, yeah, $545. To yeah, ride he was from charged, he was charged 101 times, which is kind of ridiculous because yeah. I, I used to take Bart every day going to Station X. Right. And, you know, there are just straight up people who walk through. You know, they just walk through the turnstiles, don't pay anything. There's this, a kind man who's just paying with his clipper card. He's finally, he's like, hey, I don't know what's going on. He shows his clipper card and they charge him this many times. It kind of gets you thinking that he should just he should have just not said anything or just walked straight in. Well, obviously he got charged, so he needed to talk about it. But you know, it's get... sad that the people who are actually paying are going through this when they're people who yeah. are just jumping right right past the, the turnstiles. Don't people get caught when they do that kind of stuff? You you think they did, but I, I saw it pretty pretty frequently, and they just brazenly walk in all the time. Wow, I mean that's that's a lot. That's a uh, I thought there were like BART police that would catch you if you did that. I would be afraid to do that. Like I'd be embarrassed to get caught. Yeah, it's uh, it, it's bad because they're like, oh, what do you do for a living? Oh, yeah, I work for a... <laughs> I'm sure you could afford to just pay for your BART rides, sir. But, um, you know, people... Uh... Yeah, I don't know. But I'm not paying 545 from uh, Oakland to Fremont. That's for sure. I don't know. Definitely not. South Fremont Station is very nice, though, but not worth the $545 uh, receipt that he got. He said that he had a CVS-worthy digital receipt, which is, uh, you can only imagine how long that receipt looked like. That's a, a very long, very uh, sad little receipt. And I wonder if you have to fight them or if it's easy to get your refund. I don't know. That's quite a commute. And, and there's uh, always something weird about Bart. You know, there was that janitor who used to just work overtime. Like, I think it was in the Union Square station. He would just yeah. hide in the closet and he, like, collected over 500000 or some absurd amount of money just working overtime. So, Bart, you need to clean up a little bit. Yeah. Well, speaking of uh, money, let's uh, bring in Steve Moskowitz because he's going to help you uh, straighten out any money issues you have with uh, regards to taxes. Good morning, Steve Moskowitz. Good morning, Kim. How are you? And we're happy to help you with any of your tax issues. Okay, the first tax issue that I think a lot of us have is this information that because of wildfires and storms and you know flooding and what have you, that this is it the state of California and the federal government has no, pushed just, back the filing deadline to October. Can you tell you, me that's just the state, and before people go off and make a mistake, okay, they should clarify that with whoever does their tax returns. There's a lot more to it. And you don't want to wind up getting all kinds of federal penalties too. Okay. If they choose us to do their tax return, we'll help them with all of that because there's a lot of other things that have to be considered. And also I'd like to talk about ERC because it just amazes me how many firms are contacting people right. and they're just doing the first test, the easy test. Because as we know with ERC, the federal government is rewarding employers who employed people during 2020 and 2021 with up to $26,000 for every employee that they have. That qualifies. Two ways to qualify. The easy way is certain drop in gross revenue. But it boggles me how many firms, how many CPAs are just doing the easy test. And if you don't qualify under the easy test, oh, that's it. No ERC for you. Wrong. The law has two tests. They say either or. The other test, if, if you fail the gross revenue test, if your gross revenue didn't go down by a certain amount, there's still another way to qualify that a lot of people qualify for. Obviously, not everybody, but a lot of people do. It's just it's a lot more work for the professional, and a lot of them are just not bothering. So the bottom line is, if you've been turned down elsewhere and somebody said you don't qualify for ERC because your gross revenue didn't drop enough, call us for a second opinion because a lot of people still do qualify. And if you qualify under the second method, 
you get every penny that you'd get under the first method. Not to mention, we're happy to help you with any of your other tax matters. Yeah. Uh, is there, are we ever going to see the end of ERC? When does yes. the program go go dark? So there is an end to it. We're not there yet. But the bottom line is, don't just forget about it and I'll get around to it someday. Yeah. It's Yes, the program will end. Not to mention the fact that almost everybody, if they have an opportunity to receive free money, they probably want it today rather than tomorrow. Absolutely. Yes, I want it now. I just wondered if, you know, this is something that's going on in five years or will people still no, be qualifying no, no, for it? Or the statute of limitations. This program oh. will end. Okay. And if you miss the statute by one day, too bad that you were, you know, under a rock or, you know, God forbid, in a coma or something else. When the statute runs, that's it. So you don't want to miss that. Yeah. Steve Moskowitz at 888-TAX-DEAL or at moskowitzllp.com. The one to call for any tax issues. Lots of other stuff too. What, what People can call you if they've got HR issues, if they need a little help with retirement planning, all that stuff, right? Absolutely. We're here yeah. for you. Awesome. Thank you, Steve Moskowitz. We appreciate it. Take care. Thanks. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. So Steve Moskowitz, absolutely. 888-TAX-DEAL. The Mark Thompson Moskowitz. Show. LLP.com all at the bottom there. There's a story. This is, I mean, you've got people in East Palestine, Ohio, already dealing with the aftermath of this train derailment, this toxic train derailment, worried about the water, worried about their environment, uh, worried about being sick because of it. And now there's a new story that federal officials are re reassuring Ohio residents no hazardous materials were spilled after a second major train derailment in that state. Hazmat teams on the scene what? Saturday's derailment near Springfield. Yes, National Transportation Safety Board Chair Jennifer Homendy, uh, Homendy says the train wasn't carrying any hazardous materials this time. The Norfolk Southern train was operated by the same company involved in last month's toxic chemical spill. So I don't know. Not a good of look course, for this you know. company, right? <laughs> Woo. When it rains, it pours with the when things get bad. But it's really unfortunate. It's weird because you're getting people in leadership and people, you know, like the, the politicians saying all like one thing about this whole situation. But the people are yep. clearly saying different. Like, headaches, fatigue, respiratory issues, mm -hmm. just just how the area smells. It's It's weird to see it's not lining up here. No, it isn't lining up. And but also you wonder, I mean, is it is it real or do you you know, you it's in your brain that you're worried about it? Is it psychosomatic? Is it a little bit of each? Like what's happening? Who knows? The government, of course, saying the tests are coming back safe. But I think when you have a second train derailment, even if it wasn't carrying toxic chemicals this time around, the fact that that happened again and that it could have could have been right because the restrictions aren't in place. I mean, how many more times this is is this going to happen? So I don't know. I and feel it's still like really fresh, yeah. right? It, the the yeah. first one just happened, and it's been uh, obviously in the front and center of news right now. And to have this another crash, of course, you know, of course it's happening. But if, to have yeah. it again, it's it's concerning just in in yeah. general. So I'm I'm sure Absolutely. the whole system will have to get checked throughout the country of this not happening anymore. Yeah. So I don't know if we tweeted. I know Mark likes to tweet out that we're on the air. But did you know Twitter was having some big problems? This is a story Twitter confirming a widespread disruption in some features after an internal change made by the platform today. Users apparently reporting issues including broken links, loading images, access to third-party apps connected to Twitter accounts, the Twitter support and CEO Elon Musk later following up with uh, an update on the issue saying the platform is so brittle. What does that mean? That really inspires a lot of confidence to use Twitter. Yeah. Um, and unfortunately, <laughs> that's where all my uh, millennials get their news. Oh, <laughs> so they clearly didn't get any news this morning. But uh, the, the links weren't working. I was also sc scrolling Twitter this morning. Like, where is mm -hmm. everything? Why isn't it working? But it is. Seem yeah. It does seem to be up now. But. I mean, the video system on Twitter, if you're using it on mobile, is so grainy and it takes forever to load, whether you're on Wi-Fi connection or like that's the one thing I want him to fix. Uh, Elon, please fix the video system because 
Uh, I'm a huge sports fan, obviously. I'm the commissioner, and I get a lot of my sports highlights on Twitter, and sometimes it's buffering, and it's 2023. It's not like it's 2007 YouTube where you have to wait a long time to watch your video. So Speaking it's, of, uh, yeah, go ahead. No, no, it's just, it's just ridiculous. Just fix the videos, Elon. You mentioned being the commissioner and sports, and of course, there was a big story yesterday about the kicker and them not renewing, is it gold? Yeah, Robbie Gold. Yeah, he, and he, I don't know. He, seems I, to be, I, uh, he was old, reliable for us, but also he came with a very heavy he price tag, and we need to pay some of our, I don't want to say more important players, because Kicker yeah. is a very important. He he wins or loses games. Right, and so see, to me, Albert, this wasn't seeming like such a big price tag. I mean, when you look at some of these players and how much they're making, $4 million was like, hey, if, if you've just paid $4 million for the winning kick of your game, maybe in the NFL, that's kind of a bargain. So I, I was surprised by that. Yeah, but they're kind of constrained by the salary cap. There's only so much money they could spend. And we have slightly more important players who are on the field at more for more plays who need to get paid, including Nick Bosa, so who's very important. So... We just need to pay our players, oh. and unfortunately, we're going to have to figure out what the kicker situation is going to be. Oh, okay. I, You know, I think that 49ers and fandom will regret it. The next game that gold is out, and there's a new kicker in place, and it's all lost on that very last kick, field goal or something like that. That four million dollars is going to look pretty cheap. But I might here, have I'll... to. I might have to tab this uh, this timestamp here, Kim, because if they do miss it, I will clip it. I will clip the missed kick with your audio in the background with you calling it, Kim, and then I will relinquish my title as the commissioner. I will be co-commissioner with Kim. McCallister no, no, no. I have no business being in any commissioner chair, but uh, I, I just think that that's a pretty valuable position. It just doesn't seem like a lot to me. Mark, it's a Mark very was, weird. Uh, it's a weird position. It's a valuable yeah. position because. You literally have one job. It's the sweetest gig in the NFL minus you have all the weight of the world on your shoulders at one yeah. play of the game. But the rest of the game, you're kind of just sitting and hanging out with your friends on the yeah. sideline making $4 million. Then again, he's 40. So kickers, is that... you, if you're a really good kicker, Kim, you could kick forever. It's like being a backup Ooh. quarterback. Backup quarterbacks, you could be 40 and great. And there, you just need Going to fill in shape. the spaces. Good Ready shape. Ready to go. You know, I always tell everyone, and I use I I love this show Blue Mountain State. Very, I don't think this show would would fly in 2023, but 2010, 2011, I love that show. And the joke was, it's always good to be the backup quarterback. You're still on the team. You you can still play a couple games. Sure. You won't get injured. You won't get this, and you'll still make millions of dollars. So. Well, yeah, you don't get the crap beaten out of you, it. right? You don't have the brain injury at the end of it all. I don't know. Uh, so, Mr. Gold. I think you're worth the four million, but we'll see what happens to the 49ers. All right, let's do some news. What do you think? I like that game. Let me I like it too. Ready. There it is. And this is the Mark Thompson Show. I'm Kim McAllister. This report sponsored by Tax Attorney Steve Moskowitz at 888 Tax Deal. So as we'd mentioned, officials are saying there are no safety concerns after a second train derailment in Ohio. While hazmat teams were on the scene of Saturday's derailment near Springfield, the National Transportation Safety Board Chair Jennifer Homendy says there was no spill of any hazardous materials. The second derailment appear, uh, coming a month after the Norfolk Southern train, another one, same company, carrying hazardous materials derailed, sparking major environmental and health concerns in the town of East Palestine. The chairman of the Federal Reserve set to face questions on Capitol Hill, a Jerome Powell appearing before a Senate committee tomorrow and a House panel on Wednesday to discuss the central bank's latest semi-annual monetary policy report. His testimony coming ahead of the February jobs report that comes out at the end of the week. There's a decision expected in July as the FDA reviews an Alzheimer's treatment. It's called the Lakembi treatment, and it showed apparently a 27% slowdown in disease progression in clinical trials, but it also had some pretty sketchy side effects that could include brain swelling and bleeding, in addition to costing more than $26,000 a year. We'll see what the FDA has to My say bad. about that. My bad. I'm sorry. 
Yeah. First Lady rejecting the idea of competency tests for elderly politicians. On CNN, Jill Biden calling the proposal by Republican presidential candidate Nikki Haley ridiculous. This comes as there are concerns about President Biden's age, as he would be 82 at his inauguration if he is reelected in 2024. And there was a bird strike believed to be the cause of a scary incident on a flight to Fort Lauderdale Hollywood International Airport. It was a Southwest Airlines flight out of Cuba, had to return to Havana yesterday after an engine caught fire. Apparently that airline hit a bird right after takeoff. Kind of scary. Prime Video unveiling the trailer for the Russo Brothers' new spy series called Citadel. This one has Richard Madden, Priyanka Chopra, Jonas, uh, as Mason Kane and Nadia Smith. They're apparently former members of the independent spy agency Citadel who have no memory of their time as spies. That one hits video April 28th. So something else to look forward to. I'm Kim McAllister. This report sponsored by tax attorney Steve Moskowitz. For more than 30 years, Steve has put his tax knowledge to work for individuals and for businesses. If you need help with your taxes, please call Steve Moskowitz. He's at 888-TAX-STEAL or at moskowitzllp.com. The Mark Thompson Show. Y'all can all go to hell and I'm going back to Texas. I misspoke. And I wanted to apologize to the Asian community, the Asian American community. Why are you yelling? It was great. I loved it. How would you handle this? We could try ignoring it, sir. They pay me a lot of money for having attitude. There's never been anything like this. We've never seen anything like it before. Nobody has ever put something like this together that I've ever seen. Have you ever seen anything like this? There is nothing in our history that quite compares to this. I think I'm the most honest human being, perhaps, that God ever created. God bless America. The end. Someone did this to spoil our Christmas. Oh my God, oh my God, oh my God. Sayonara, sucker. You know what, pal? You created the habit of chaos. I don't think you should apologize for how you feel. Do I hit it long? Is Trump strong? Huh? Who is having that conversation? It is the Mark Thompson Show, and thank you for being here on this Monday. And you know what that means. It is Mark's Murder Mystery Monday. I do want to uh, ask you before we jump over to Courtney, who is so kind to join us today, to please click the like button. I forgot to ask you at the beginning. Just click it. Smash click it, it with click, your click, click iron it. rod. Oh, smash it with your iron rod. And we will take your like and be very grateful for it. So thank you for that. Right now, let's bring on the beautiful and mysterious. Welcome to Mark's Red Rock. Murder Red Rock. Mystery Red Rock. Monday. She is Mark Thompson's better half. She is amazing. She is Courtney. Hi, Courtney. Hi. Thank you How for having me. That was the kindest introduction I've had on the show yet. <laughs> <laughs> you are I beautiful yet you. mysterious. <laughs> Mm -hmm, with your hat and your glasses all shady like you know it's so funny actually my sister <laughs> my sister was on youtube and she got served the mark mark's murder mystery segment and she said that picture looks like my sister like she didn't realize that i was watching it <laughs> kind of looks that, like you yeah, yeah. <laughs> she said that looks like my sister so uh, uh you what know, a testament to the artist yeah who created it but oh that's awesome <laughs> so you have a story today that i am fascinated by and i'm uh i can't wait to hear you tell it oh my gosh yes well thank you for sending it to me and i have to say i am so grateful i've had 
many people reach out to me with stories and not only is it very helpful, <laughs> but it but it means so much that people are connecting with this segment and wanting yeah. to participate. Yeah. So I, I'm very grateful. And I'm remiss in not mentioning that Calvin Wong uh, gave me the story last week of um, of the Boston Strangler. And so, yeah. I mean, I, I do think um, he's the most communicative man in my life. And I'm grateful <laughs> that. Way to go, Calvin Wong. Wong. <laughs> <laughs> in that. So I am, I'm very grateful. And, and thank you for sending me this story. And, I, you know, I had a lot of really good feedback last week, in addition to stories just about the segment as a whole. And I think that people okay. really want to hear about California stories. So this story was perfect. And that's a big lead up for what is the story around the lady in the fridge. What does it say that that's the headline I saw, the lady in the fridge? And I'm like, oh, Courtney, <laughs> click, send. <laughs> <laughs> true. It's so true. It's mm -hmm. funny. You can't take me to dinner parties because I'll end up just talking about murder the whole time. And Mark will very quickly lose interest in it. But um, I remember we went, we went on a double date a couple months ago and we spent 90% of the evening talking about murders and <laughs> I, I thought I might have my own on the ride home. Um, that's but, not fake. That's, so that's real. <laughs> it's something I think that people are interested in and, and there is a sense of hoping that justice is served, right? I don't um, think right. you should apologize for how you feel. <laughs> Absolutely. I completely agree. <laughs> I have to say though, it's funny, I was prepping it and, you know, because Mark's out of town. Yeah. Like, it gets a little dark and I'm like, oh, this, this feels a little different. <laughs> when I'm home talking about women being killed versus when there's someone else in the house to oh, creepy. maybe protect me. Yeah. Um, I, I, I probably on my own laurels on that, but, but it's, it's very funny how different that is, but yeah. I am going to talk, <laughs> I'm going to talk about the lady in the fridge. Um, Kim was so nice to send me the story, but I do want to mention, um, there was an incredible podcast called True Crime in Depth with Chip Mahoney, and he did a fascinating and really great job on this story. And I listened to it several times throughout the day yesterday. And so I, I, I want to attribute a lot of the information I got from him and also the L.A. Times. Mm -hmm. um, so on March 29th, 1995, the body of a young woman was found inside a refrigerator, partially submerged in an irrigation canal in the San Joaquin County community of Holt. Um, and so for three decades, this woman went as the lady in the fridge because she was unidentified and the case eventually went cold. Can you first, can you imagine what a way to go? Like what, how awful would that be to have to be bound and thrown in a fridge? And I can only hope she was dead before she went in there. I know. I, it's, it's so true. It, it is. It's so scary. And if you go down, Albert, if you don't mind, I can show you. I started out with who she was, but if you can go down, I can show you this. So this is the canals in the areas that she was found. Mm -hmm. Actually, some of the listeners are probably more familiar with us San Joaquin Valley and Holt, California. Right. Um, and this gentleman here in the red hat, if you go down one more slide, I tried to find his name. I couldn't. Uh, maybe he did not want to be named, but he actually found her. So he found the refrigerator and he was effectively, this is strange, looking for cans, found a refrigerator, hooked that to his car and pulled it out of a ravine, which if you go down one, um, I'm if I'm looking at this refrigerator, I know there's only a body in it. There's nothing else. That's <laughs> Your mind goes straight to body. <laughs> Not yeah. like, you know, just abandoned, dumped fridge, empty. <laughs> Courtney's like, no, nope, body. There is nothing good <laughs> that is in this refrigerator. I don't and think you should apologize <laughs> for how you feel. Yeah, there's nothing. But he takes the refrigerator, connects it to his truck, and he pulls it out of a ravine. And if you go down one, you'll see the interior of the refrigerator. And yes, unfortunately, she was in the interior of this refrigerator. Now, 
The refrigerator was found on March 29th in 1995, but they think that she was in there for a little while because the water had almost entombed the body. So unfortunately, there was a lot of degradation. So it was very hard to um, get any sort of um, resemblance of what she would have looked like. Um, so she remained for 27 years or 29 years as unidentified. Inside of that refrigerator, um, she was wrapped in two blankets, but she was also in a sleeping bag. And she was very well dressed. Um, she had on um, expensive hiking boots, blue uh, striped socks. She had on a sweatshirt and t-shirt short. She was wearing her diamond wedding, wedding ring, even though she was separated from her husband. And she was also wearing, I, I have one more slide if you go down. Uh, she was wearing costume jewelry. So this is one of the pieces of costume jewelry that she was wearing that they had um, shown to the public to try to identify her. Um, she had, interestingly enough, she had reddish blonde hair or red hair, um, actually, when they found her. And so this gentleman pulls her up, they find her. And uh, then 20, I think it's 29 or 27 years later, they identify her through geneal investigative genealogy. So through these sites where you test her genealogy, they were able to match her to a family member and then speak to that family member. And that family member was able to identify her as, and if you could go up, Amanda Lynn Schumann Deza. So if you, uh, yeah, if you don't mind going up a little bit, Albert, for everyone that's listening, um, she's this beautiful young blonde mom. She was a mom of three. She was married, but she had separated from her husband. And the last time anybody had seen Amanda was at a, an apartment complex in Napa, where she was with someone that she had been in uh, a rehabilitation facility with. So I think there was a sense that she had fallen on hard times. Had some drug uh, issues or substance abuse problems. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. I think they said that without expressly saying that. But yeah. um, And she was known as a free spirit. And I think she liked... <laughs> now, the, the podcast I listened to with Chip Mahoney had mentioned that she was a free spirit and she really liked um, going to music concerts. So um, he, there's a theory that I'll talk about that he had, but maybe that's why she had on sort of hiking boots and like more sort of informal, you know, outfit is that she was somehow going to out with, with whomever she went out with. But that is what she was found in and, that is all they knew of her um, after the identifica identification. They're looking now to find people who knew Amanda that might have a better sense of who within her, you know, friends and, and acquaintances might have, um, might be a suspect. So um, the, the podcast I listened to had a really interesting theory um, so if you go down a little bit, thank you so much. So um, just down a little bit more. Okay, perfect. So as I mentioned, in the podcast I was listening to, he talked about Amanda being a free spirit, that she really loved music festivals. And he had this very specific idea of what happened to Amanda. So I'm going to walk everybody through it. But I will say that this is uncooperated. This is Chip Mahoney's idea of what happened, but I thought it was really interesting. Um, so we know that Amanda was found in a refrigerator in Holt, California, which is in the San Joaquin Valley, somewhat in and around sort of the San Francisco area, you know, um, mid-California area. Sure. Um, he seemed to think that she was very much a fan of Sheryl Crow. He was very much stuck on this idea uh, that Sheryl Crow embodied sort of the free free woman, you know, women empowerment. And Sheryl Crow actually really had kind of a meteoric rise in the first half, first nine months of 1994. So he believes very much that Amanda went to the Horde Festival, which for people who are watching this, I have two of the posters from the Horde Festival. 
Um, this is very much like blues traveler, black crows, that kind of music. And actually it was mostly um, male forward male bands, but Sheryl Crow was actually the exception in 1994. So Chip believes that Amanda went and saw um, Sheryl Crow, fell in love with Sheryl Crow at the Horde Festival, and then actually went to the Warfield Theater to, she, to see Sheryl Crow. I think it was like October of no, or November of 1994. The Warfield in, the, in San Francisco? Yes, exactly. Okay. And then we're not sure exactly when she went missing because there was never a missing persons report filed. Her family was looking for her, but there was never one filed. Um, and so the concert happens in like October, November of 1994. And then um, the body of Amanda is found in March. So that gives you like those six months that the, um, the uh, police uh, believe that her body sat entombed in that water in the refrigerator. Um, so if you just go down one more. So there was a young woman by the name of, her name was actually Renee Shapiro. She went by Sarah Shapiro, but she changed her name with her friends to Sarah Dillon to mirror or mimic Bob Dylan's real wife. She was a huge Bob Dylan fan. She actually- Wait, she uh, named herself after Bob Dylan's wife? Yeah. yeah. Uh, creepy. That's like crazy ex-girlfriend status. You do creepy. not know it, what you are talking is. about. <laughs> uh. It is It is a little- it is a little single white female. Um, <laughs> yes. And, it, you know, there's fans and then there's like fans that aren't allowed within 100 feet of Bob Dylan. And she's probably there's never been anything line. like this. Yeah. <laughs> she, <laughs> so Sarah Dylan is what I will call her. But um, she loved Bob Dylan. She went to every single show of his, I think, for a span of five or 10 years, every single show. Wow. And so, that's, yeah, that's commitment right there. That is commitment. I know. I mean, I don't know that I've ever done anything in my life. <laughs> that kind Not of like movie. that. No. <laughs> and so uh, in 1992, she goes to the Warfield Theater. She sees Bob Dylan and she goes missing. And she's found in the Nevada County, California, um, and she has been murdered by the, the next slide, the serial killer, Joseph Nazo. And so Chip Mahoney believes that Amanda probably fell in love with um, uh, Cheryl Crow, went to the Warfield Theater to see her after the Horde Festival, and was probably a victim of uh, Joseph Nazo. Oh, he so that, the, that the two yeah. cases may be linked and somehow... <laughs> Yes, that she's maybe four, one of the four women that were never identified, but he kept very specific records of all of the women that he had interactions with. Joseph Nazo did, the serial <laughs> killer and serial rapist. As one does, uh, a serial record yeah. keeping serial killer, you I know. Mean, most people diary about <laughs> other things that are slightly more uplifting, but this <laughs> horrible person... <laughs> kept copious notes about the terrible things that he was doing. Um, uh, I've given a very small example so you can see his crazy person handwriting on, on the right-hand side, but um, I've, I've left out some of the more, um, uh, you know, distasteful notes. Um, so I thought this was a really interesting theory. He certainly put a lot of work into bringing around how he thought she might have died. I mean, clearly she had fallen on difficult times. She was not communicating yeah. with her family. One might think she was in rehabilitation because she obviously was before and mm -hmm. still um, interacting or, or, or spending time with people from the rehabilitation facilities. Yeah. But um, I thought that was an interesting concept um, that this gentleman, Chip, had put a lot of time into. So it's just nice to hear that they have now given her name back and that we can hope uh, that justice is served to uh, whomever has um, done this unspeakable crime. So no arrest, but are they, do, is there any indication that there's, a, there's movement in that direction? Not that I know of. I listened mm. to the press, um, I listened to the press announcements uh, last week and um, 
the police and investigative officers were mostly giving information about Amanda and asking for the help of the public. Um, but it, it let's yeah, we, we can hope that with her name, um, people might have more information as to who she was spending time with or what she was spending time doing. And maybe I Chip Mahoney's idea isn't, isn't so uh, crazy. <laughs> well, I don't know if he kept copious <laughs> records and that he, you know, yeah. she wasn't really covered in the, you know, I put her in the fridge page, the, yeah. uh, you know, I, I, it's interesting. You talk about how she was a free spirit, right? never officially reported missing, even though her family was looking for her. And that's kind of scary because when you have a person like that who, you know, takes off and does their own thing and is kind of flitting around back and forth and something bad happens, that's the problem with that is if, you know, you don't have a check in, you don't have someone that, you know, is is waiting for you or that you're due home, then she's never the police are never really into it until way late. Yeah. No, you're so right. You're you're so right. Um it is. It's, it's really scary. And this is, as you ma might imagine, like one of many stories that I've heard like that. Yeah. And, and it's so devastating to these families. In fact, the Boston Strangler story that we covered last week, the one female victim, I mean, she had, she was homeless. Like she would spend periods of time not communicating with her mother. And um, I think that her mother was only... I told that she was killed because she was killed outside of the Los Angeles, you know, uh, a very high profile building in Los Angeles. So mm -hmm. her mother was told that and you can see the devastation and you're right. I mean, it's, it's just so sad that um, things like that could happen. And we know that the family was in fact looking for Amanda and just didn't have, what they needed to, to even do a search that, that might be able to uncover what had happened to her. Um, so scary. And so interesting how these killers are able to pinpoint people who they think don't matter. No one will be looking for, yeah. you know, how they're able to kind of zero in on, on that to help them get away with crimes. It's so true. It's so true. It's, creepy it's what keeps me up at night because i know i'm, <laughs> oh, I'm victim number one the next <laughs> no you're not no is that what it is with you though is that like the fear of being a victim or is it just like the what draws you to it is the the psychology behind the killer or yeah both? It's, it's a good question i i in many ways it's it's the psychological profile of the killer it's also putting all of the pieces together and understanding, mm -hmm. trying to understand the makeup of the story and then um, almost that discovery of who did it. Um, and so, but it's funny. I mean, there's definitely a lot of t-shirts out there you could, that you can buy that said the husband did it or the wife did it. <laughs> <laughs> most of the time. <laughs> it's why Mark sleeps with one eye open. I tell you. Oh, um, no. hey, which one do you use? Mark Thompson? <laughs> someone in the house. It's someone in the family. So, um, but yeah, I think that's why it's definitely, mm -hmm. um, I'm, I'm, I'm fascinated with these stories and I, I'm also someone that very much wants the right thing to happen. And that right. has been a really good thing for me and, and not a really good thing for me because unfortunately a lot of times the right thing doesn't happen. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. Or it can take way too long. <laughs> and then you get to the, to a point where you see these people who've done these awful unspeakable things mm -hmm. and they've for decades gotten away with it and by the time they're arrested they're in their late 60s early 70s and it's like okay now you're going to pay the price at the very end of your life but look at yes. all the years that you had scot-free you know and yes. and penalty free after you did this horrible thing to this person and it doesn't seem fair i know no you're right it doesn't it it, mm. it really doesn't and it doesn't doesn't feel like justice has been served. And then you can't ever really get it to where it might feel like that person will have to suffer even 
even in a, a, a small way as to the unfortunate suffering of the family and the loved ones yeah. um, of these victims and the impact those victims would have had on the lives of so many, which might include their friends and family and kids. And it's, yeah, it's just horrible. No, I mean, yeah. I, I the, the, for all those reasons, I, yeah. And, and I, I just, yeah, I, I think it's interesting putting together the pieces and, and trying to figure out who, who's, who's done it. Um, I remember being a, a kid in grade school and asking a policeman who was, I don't can't remember what he was doing, but I remember raising my hand and asking him how many serial killers were active <laughs> in where I lived at the time, San Diego. And I remember him looking at me like, that's probably not a question as seven or eight year old. <laughs> even <laughs> then, Courtney, even yeah. then. Even then I was trying to fight crime. Um, but, oh, that's so yeah, funny. So I don't think you should apologize for how you feel. Well, Courtney, I can't even say we love you. We love oh, uh, watching you. you kind of think about all these things and putting these puzzle pieces together in this real life, these real life scenarios. So you always bring the most fascinating cases to us. And I can't thank you for being here enough, even though Mark's not here. Oh, uh, you, you came out to play. So thank you very much. Oh, my gosh. Thank you for having me. I am so incredibly grateful. And again, I'm, I'm incredibly. I am so thankful for the response of the fans of the Mark Thompson show and the stories that they send and the advice and the feedback. So please know, I try to get back to everybody, but I'm, I'm incredibly grateful. So um, next week I will bring another story that someone has sent to me. <laughs> Ooh, cool. If you yeah. want to reach Courtney, it is the Mark Thompson show at gmail.com is the address. And we'll make sure she gets your, your uh, messages. So thank you, Courtney, for being here. Have a great rest of your week. Thank you. Take care. Bye. Bye. Mark's Murder Mystery Monday on the Mark Thompson show. Ooh, that was a good one, the lady in the fridge, and I hope her killer is caught. Um, my thanks to Courtney for uh, that story, that story and that case and that very uh, interesting, uh, the way she laid it all out. It's fascinating. Let's do a little news. The Mark Thompson yeah. Show. Let's get a little news, and then we will talk to Michael Hiltzik about some of the really interesting things that he is focusing on as of late. But first, the news. I'm Kim McAllister on The Mark Thompson Show. This report sponsored by tax attorney Steve Moskowitz at 888-TAX-DEAL. It doesn't look super impressive, does it? But apparently that is a view unlike any other of snow blanketing Northern California. The International Space Station flew over the Sierra Nevada Saturday after last week's storm caused blizzard conditions. And apparently the video starts in Redding. It includes Lake Tahoe where the snowpack levels are nearly 200% of normal. What? New records though could be set after another storm hit over the weekend, but that's what it looks like from space. Just a whole lot of frozen snow. Yeesh. There is a man behind bars. He is charged with blowing up Northern California's electric transformers. This 36-year-old man charged for the damage done to two PG&E electric transformers. Uh, they are in the South Bay in San Jose between December and January. The explosions left thousands without power. Police also claim this man had an inactive meth lab in his home as well. So lots of explosive things going on with him. Speaking of PG&E, California's biggest utility bringing relief, well, some relief, as winter storms lead to higher bills. PG&E issuing its climate credit earlier than expected. And that means customers will see about a 75% drop in how much they're paying this month for natural gas. The credit comes from the state's emission allowance program. It's handed out every spring and fall. The average bill expected to be about $37 compared to $150 last month. Again, that's just for gas. The state taking another step toward uh, forward, rather, in the pandemic because mask mandates in all healthcare settings are set to end next month. 
Mm, that's kind of, that's just, this one kind of makes me a little bit nervous. It goes for workers, patients, and visitors. Correctional facilities and homeless shelters across California will also do the same as of April 3rd. Meantime, starting one week from today, people who test positive for COVID may end isolation after five days if they feel well and they have no fever for 24 hours. We are really taking the belt off and letting it all hang out, aren't we? Jurors in the double murder trial of Alex Murda are speaking out. Uh, the jurors appearing on the Today Show, and here is what they had to say. Uh, three jurors saying they don't believe Murda should have taken the stand in his own defense because his emotions just did not seem genuine. The disbarred, once wealthy South Carolina lawyer was sentenced on Friday to two consecutive life terms for the 2021 murders of his wife and his youngest son. And a little lighter, uh, Chris Rock addressing the infamous Will Smith Oscar slap. Let me get the picture of Mr. Murdaugh off the screen because it doesn't apply. Uh, he makes history with Netflix's first ever live broadcast. Rock insisted anyone who says words hurt has never been punched in the face. Rock has not spoken out about the 2022 slap in interviews or on social media, but he did so on his comedy tour. And lastly, Johnny Very smart Depp move, by the way, Kim, you know, you got to hold that and then you got to capitalize on it. Like I said, we, we're, we we're talking before the show. This is America. Yeah. Kim. You got to You got to You got to make your money. I guess so. I mean, if you're going to get slapped, you're going to get paid for it. Right. Oh, uh, uh, speaking of getting paid, Johnny Depp is selling a collection of original portraits in London. It's a four-piece collection titled Friends and Heroes 2. It's available for about $21,000. The portraits are of Heath Ledger, Bob Marley, River Phoenix, and Hunter S. Thompson, apparently painted by Johnny Depp. This report sponsored by tax attorney Steve Moskowitz for more than 30 years. Steve has put his tax knowledge to work for individuals and for businesses. So if you're looking for help with your taxes, Steve Moskowitz is the one. It is 888-TAX-DEAL or MoskowitzLLP.com. I'm Kim McAllister on The Mark Thompson Show. The Mark Thompson Show. Mash it with your iron rod. Who's Mark Thompson? Hey, which one of you is Mark Thompson? What he's got going here is a situation. It's unbelievably offensive. Put up your pants, my man. Pull up those pants. Ralph Nader just sent me a book. Did he send you one too? I offer this sincere apology to you today. Everything is going extremely well. Call me a liar. Now what do you call him? You, sir, are a liar. You are a cover-up artist and you are a liar. Why a liar? Your pants are on fire! A Google told me. Can you let him finish, sir? It was wrong, it was stupid, and I'm trying to be a better person. No, no, no. I'm going to tell you what I think. What do the porn stars do with me? Do you have a single count? Isn't anybody been a wee? 100% effective, how about that? Say what? And this is the new host. There is no defense for my conduct. I misspoke. I stand corrected. And I wanted to apologize to the Asian community, the Asian American community. Time's up, mother effers. It is the Mark Thompson Show. I'm Kim McAllister, in for Mark. Got Albert along for the ride and very excited now to include the man. He has lots of Pulitzers rolling around the old office, LA Times uh, winning columnist and author. It is Michael Hiltzik, everybody. Welcome to the show. Thank you, Kim. Thanks for having me. And, uh, Hi. Uh, you know, where's Mark? Mark is in Washington, D.C., and his dad has been ill. So he is doing some family stuff in Washington, D.C. with his dad, who is uh, recovering from some things and uh, kind of getting out of the hospital and going to doctor's appointments and such. 
So that's the story there. Uh, go blue because I love your sweatshirt and you ha truly have my favorite office in all of journalism. I tried yeah. to clean it up, but uh, you know, I just, it's just too much. Don't clean it up. It's beautiful. It's perfect. Uh, lo I'd love to talk to you about one of the articles you wrote because it's been something that is, has been on my mind. Uh, we just talked about COVID and how in healthcare settings here in California, they're taking away mask requirements. They're doing it in homeless shelters, uh, prison settings as well. And we've been talking a lot about this whole low confidence from the energy department that uh, COVID originated from a lab in Wuhan. And so I wonder if you can kind of talk a little bit about your article and uh, whether we think this low confidence bears any fruit or why they would release such a thing. Sure. Well, <clears throat> as you may know, I've been covering this issue uh, that is the origin of COVID for really two years, maybe three years at this point. Um, and uh, there have been two sort of competing theories. One is the theory that's followed by virtually every expert in the field, that's virologists and epidemiologists. And these are the people who know and have paid attention and done the research. And their conclusion almost, overwhelmingly, almost unanimously, is that COVID didn't reach the human population via wildfire. Uh, we don't know exactly what animal or animals uh, uh, allowed the virus to make the jump, but that's the way that uh, pathogens typically reach humans. Uh, they come from animals. This is called the zoonosis uh, hypothesis. And okay. as I said, it's accepted by really uh, the, the entire scientific community. And the other side is this hypothesis that it leaked the virus leaked from a lab, specifically a Chinese virology lab in Wuhan. There is no evidence. And when I say no evidence, I want to stress the no. There's not a speck, a smidgen, an iota of evidence to support that hypothesis. It's a political hypothesis. It was originally ginned up by Trump uh, aides in the U.S. State Department during his administration. And it was they faded because it was a, a weapon against China, which uh, the Trump administration was in a sort of geopolitical spat with at the time. Uh, really, after the first week or so of research into the virus, as we're talking about, you know, January, mid-January 2020, there was just no credibility in the scientific community for this theory, but it, it lives on as sort of a zombie theory because it's pushed by ideologues and, uh, you know, political opportunists. So what happened? Well, you know, a week or so ago, um, the Wall Street Journal, which has been pushing the lab leak hypothesis for years and years, had a, a story in which they said that the Department of Energy, which is technically part of the, the government's um, intelligence community, had decided that uh, it was most likely that the virus uh, leaked from a lab. But most likely, uh, it's hard to say take that seriously because the Department of Energy said that they had, quote, low confidence. What's that, that mean? Ruling. Now, low confidence, yeah. well, it's a good question. It's a term of art in government circles. And, and, they, and I uncovered or, you know, ferreted out the official definition of low confidence. And basically, it boils down to the fact that there's no evidence that's reliable to support this hypothesis. So, and as I wrote in my column, uh, you know, how are you supposed to read, you know, uh, something that says, you know, something's most likely, but we don't have any confidence in seeing that, saying that. Uh, nevertheless, the journal went nuts about this, uh, you know, the sort of the, the ignorant press, and that's, you know, unfortunately, a lot of press that's been, you know, that writes about uh, this issue without doing their homework, basically treated this as some sort of breakthrough, some sort of significant change in opinion. It simply isn't. And as we reported, the same supposed evidence that the Department of Energy got was shown to all of the other eight or nine agencies that had already 
basically ruled that this was most likely a zoonotic uh, uh, source or took no position. They didn't change their position when they saw the supposed evidence. So, you know, we don't know what the Department of Energy saw. The journal, the Wall Street Journal didn't know. And they didn't even see the, the paper that supposedly supported this change of heart. It got read to them, and we don't know who read it to them, but we do know that Republicans in Congress have been pushing this idea now for a long, long time. And they, it, to this date, there's been no evidence, not a speck of evidence to support it. So that's where we are. There's been no change except for the, the credulousness of members of the press uh, and, you know, and politicians. So I, f- I feel like that whole low confidence thing is key. It's it's like uh, they're playing games with the origin of COVID, using it as a political tool. There's a lot going on with China. We have the spy balloon that was shot down. We've got tensions rising with Taiwan. We had some type of uh, issue with a, a aircraft carrier or something at sea. So you just, you wonder, one wonders, I wonder, if this is all just part of some game. Well, it is a game, and it's a game that the Republicans are playing, and that Democrats, to their credit, have not been playing. But you know, it's not. It, it, this is not of trivial importance. I mean, you know, yeah. the, the origin of COVID doesn't tell us much about how to deal with it now, today. Yeah. You know how to treat it, what uh, you know, social uh, rules and regulations should be. But it's important for the future because. There will be more pathogens, there will be more pandemics and epidemics that come from viruses and other pathogens that we haven't experienced in the human population before. Knowing what the possible source is, is important because that tells us how to try to to combat these, uh, these infections before they actually arrive. And if we are focused on you know all this nonsense about gee the chinese are hiding something and you know they're they're doing all sorts of lab work that's dangerous and uh, and they're hiding uh that's going to distract us from what's really necessary which is regulating the contacts between humans and wildlife out in the wild that's what's really important and that's what will save uh, public health in the future. So, you know, not only, you know, sort of a funny distraction, but it's a dangerous distraction. It is a dangerous distraction, and it frustrates and angers me when information is used as a weapon like that. When you create, when you take something, and you just described why it's important, but you take a a key piece of information the world has been waiting to hear about. The world wants to know what why we just spent the last couple of years locked inside trying to avoid COVID. And then you take it and use it as a weapon against another country or, you know, as misinformation. And so then it creates these conspiracy theories and people, you know, trying to find all this information, the bogus information spreading around. And so when you when the real information is finally conclusive, no one's going to believe it. Well, that's true, and and, and you know you're right about that, something, which is that this uh, lab leak thing is a conspiracy theory, uh, a pure conspiracy theory, because you couldn't have a lab leak out of a Chinese lab that is secret without there being a massive conspiracy, conspiracy by lab uh, technicians and and laboratory officials, the Chinese government and the rest of the scientific community would all have to conspire together to hide the truth. And and there's just, (laughs) nobody really believes that a conspiracy on that scale is, is really plausible in the least. So let's go to uh, another article that you wrote. And this is some, a story that popped out last week. We had two of them, uh, all from the, the conference going on in Florida, right? Where it seems like Nikki Haley was talking about being, you know, woke as being part of the liberal left. And uh, then DeSantis was talking about being woke. Is I feel like woke is going to be the word we're hearing for the 2024 presidential election, and we won't be able to get away from it. 
Well, I think if we if we do hear this word, uh, you know, people are, I, I think people are already sick of it. It's a, yeah. it's another meaningless trope, like um, you, you know, ESG for environmental, social, and governance concerns, uh, uh, you know, among investors, and uh, you know, critical race theory. I, I mean, you know, these are terms that are thrown around to the to the point that they they have lost all meaning, except that you know, for certain communities you know for you know the republican base particularly they have this sort of um you know totemic meaning that if you if you say you know critical race theory then you know you know republicans sphincters contract you know <laughs> not to be you know, not to be too too indelicate you know and you know republican politicians use this they you know they use these as code words and, and shibboleths and they don't give a damn that they've lost all meaning because they don't want them to have any meaning because if people understand what they mean they you know people would say well gee you know uh, esg investing that's pretty smart and uh critical race theory you know doesn't really exist in, in the teachings in k-12 and woke you know you know what does woke mean it means you know paying attention to the concerns of your neighbors and your fellow Americans, uh, and you know, making a, a you know, taking steps not to be unnecessarily or casually yeah. offensive to them. Right. What's wrong with that? What's wrong with trying to understand the plight of others? Uh, as far as I know, nothing's wrong with it. But you know, I'm not Ron DeSantis kind of hurry. <sighs> So apparently it's bad to be woke. They don't know what woke is. And now it seems like the buzzword for the upcoming presidential election. If you're woke, you're bad. Uh, Democrats are woke. And so down with the woke culture. Right. Well, you know, we need Democrats to sort of step up to the plate and and uh, basically, you know, defuse this. I, you know, I always thought that um, you know, I think back to the debate between George H.W. Bush and Michael Dukakis that really got me irritated because, you know, here was, you know, Bush saying, well, you know, I like Michael Dukakis. He's a good guy. I just, you know, but he's a liberal. And he, you know, and he uttered that word as though there was a bad smell in the room. And what Dukakis should have said at that point was, yes, I'm a liberal. And here's what that means. It means that, you know, I have an interest in the welfare of my fellow Americans. I think yeah. I have programs that will help the most vulnerable uh, members of our society. And we think that's good. Instead, he, like other Democrats then, and even to a certain extent today, he bailed out. He said, oh, well, you know, I'm not really liberal. And, you know, um, you know, <laughs> anyway, th the same thing is happening with these other buzzwords. Do you think there's anything that Democrats can do or say to squash the whole woke, you know, anti-woke movement? Well, I, I think basically, uh, you know, the time has come when they need to either ignore, you know, the use of this term or fight back and, and, and define it for people. Um, you know, tell, make sure that, that Democratic voters who are actually in a majority in this country, uh, understand what's at stake when you capitulate to these, these stupid uh, uh, disquisitions by Republicans. You know, basically you're saying, I, I mean, woke is really a, a code word for white supremacy. I, I don't think there's there can be any question about that. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, you also wrote an article uh, in, last month talking about it's time to get out of crypto because the government crackdown is coming and it's coming fast. Yeah, look, I've re been writing about crypto also yeah. for you know, three years, four years, maybe five years already. Um, uh, here's the bottom line. Crypto is a scam. Uh, cryptocurrencies have no real value except what you can sell them. It, you know, if you own some, you can try to sell them to the next bigger fool, you know, the greater fool uh, technique. Um, they don't, uh, <laughs> the next, the next sucker off, uh, interest. They don't, they're not a real, yeah, the next sucker, they, yeah. they don't have any value. They're not an asset. Uh, and what we have seen over the last few months, or really, you know, better part of a year, 
is that um, as often happens with assets that have only imaginary value, they've come crashing back to earth. Um, the poor, uh, you know, people who got sucked into this uh, tended to get sucked into it at the highest prices conceivable, and now they're stuck holding the bag. They've lost almost all their money. They will lose the rest of it if they don't get out now. Um, the government uh, uh, regulators are closing in because crypto is a field in which fraud and deceit is just epidemic pandemic let's say uh it's it's a scam it hurts people you know um the, the ftx which is you know the you know the big newsy collapse right you know wasn't unique it was representative of the the dangers and the problems in this entire field and we should you know we should take as as gospel what ftx has been telling us so when you say the government's closing in, do you mean they're going to put an end to it? Like you'll no longer be allowed to to pay for items with cryptocurrency? You'll no longer be allowed to buy it here in America? Or what type of regulations are coming? Well, well buying, buying things and services with crypto is already very difficult. It's very complicated. You have to go through a middleman. You have to pay fees. Um, it's really just not a substitute for using dollars, which we use. Um, what's happening is that uh, federal regulators are basically uh, ruling that crypto offerings are securities, and since they're not registered securities, they're illegal. Um, we are seeing uh, prosecutors and, and regulators closing in on fraudulent crypto operations at a very, very great rate. We're seeing the bank, the legitimate banking community is, is basically you know, hands off this stuff mm -hmm. because they don't want to be infected by the same degree of fraud and 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 deceit and just criminality. So I, I think basically um, the regulatory system has woken up. You know, they they're woke now against crypto. <laughs> um, they're closing in. They're going to regulate a lot of these businesses out of existence. Um, they're going to expose. Uh, the entire field as essentially fraudulent, and they have done so. I mean, the, uh, the the Federal Trade Commission, months and months and months, maybe more than a year ago, started issuing cautions to investors, saying, you know, stay away from this stuff right. because you're going to lose your shirts. And I think you know those warnings and those actions are going to just continue to intensify because none of the real regulators, the Federal Reserve, the banking agencies, all these things, they really do not want uh, the, the legitimate financial system to be yeah. uh, infected by this stuff. Do you feel like there's any possibility that the government will step in for for regular people left holding the bag that thought they were investing in something legitimate or that they've issued enough warnings now to get out that if you are left holding the bag at the end, it's sayonara sucker to you, your, your own fault? Well, there's just no mechanism for the government to bail anybody out. Um, you know, if you are an if you if you have money in a bank and the bank fails, then you you have you're automatically insured by the FDIC. Mm -hmm. right. If you have uh, your money at a brokerage and the brokerage fails, uh, there's also an agency that will protect you up to a certain amount of of money. It's not unlimited, but you know, two hundred fifty thousand mm -hmm. dollars per account and per person that's that's a lot um there are self-regulatory agencies that can help manage uh losses although they can't entirely bail everybody there's no such thing uh for crypto and the crypto promoters have in the past sort of used that as a uh, you know as a virtue they've said you know we're completely independent from government government can't uh you know can't interfere They've talked about how a crypto transaction is irreversible. You know, if you send your your crypto uh, assets to somebody and it's the wrong person or they abscond with it, you don't have any way to get it back. And that's supposed to be good. Well, we all know because we all live in the real world that there are you know any number of occasions when we make an investment or buy something, yep. 
and the investment goes bad or what we've bought never arrives or is um, sure. damaged or, or, or improper or something. And we can get our money back because we go through our bank uh, or, you know, our credit card. And we say, you know, we were defrauded in the bank or credit card will cover us. Mm -hmm. uh, that just doesn't happen with crypto. No, uh, there's there are no way. There's no law. There's no system to do it. No, no. There are signs around the Bay Area where that'll it'll say, uh, get crypto here or pay with Bitcoin here. There's a Tesla dealership in a, a shopping mall in Marin where it says Bitcoin accepted. I feel like these things are going to start slowly going away. Well, I'm surprised to hear that there's a Tesla uh, agency that's doing that because Elon Musk, uh, you know, a couple of years ago, he was playing with crypto and he said that he that Tesla would start accepting Bitcoin as payment. But there were, uh, you know, a number of caveats. One was, you know, crypto, Bitcoin and, and the other currencies are so volatile in price that you don't know what it's going to be worth, you know, moment to moment. Right. Um, and Musk, when he said that, you know, the, the rule at Tesla was if you are buying one of our cars with crypto, you have to make the deal within 30 minutes of uh, of making the deal. And, wow. if, and if it takes more than 30 minutes, you have to start all over again because we don't know what your Bitcoin is going to be worth. I mean, that says something that's that says uh, something right there. With Bitcoin. Yeah. And, and then within two weeks, Musk basically says, no, we're not going to accept Bitcoin for, for Tesla. So I don't know who, who in the Bay Area, you know, is selling Teslas for Bitcoin, but for it's Bitcoin? not a company. Maybe they forgot to take the sticker off the door. I don't know. That, that may well be. Yeah. <laughs> they didn't Michael, have the money left to take the billboard down. You are awesome. I love your writing and your ideas and your thoughts about things. And thank you for setting the world straight on the origin of COVID and the recent announcement. You are Michael Hiltzik, the LA Times Pulitzer Prize winning columnist and author. And I can't thank you enough for being on the Mark Thompson show, even if Mark is absent. Okay, Thank well, you. thanks to Mark, and I hope everything works out. Yeah, bye -bye. I do too. We'll see you soon. Bye-bye. Michael Hiltzik, everybody. Awesome. Thank you for being here. I wanted to take a moment to look at the chats because we haven't really seen a lot of that today. The Mark Thompson Show. And I love to put up your ideas and your thoughts uh, about everything. Yeah, we have everything. a couple shout outs too, if you want to get to that as oh, well. Oh, let's, after, let's so. do that. Let me look at some chats and see if there's anything. Did you see anything that uh, that we should talk about or deal uh, deal with as we move forward in the show? Anything um, of note? I did see this comment from John. The original dream of cryptocurrency was to be a bartering system without government mm -hmm. middlemen. It was not meant to be a way to speculate and get rich fast. But unfortunately, yeah, John, that's, that's a very became. true statement because... Yeah. The, the essence of crypto was just hands off. It's a public ledger, basically. And it's an, an exchange of goods that we are all giving value to. But but right, yeah, just like anything else here, it's a get rich quick. And let's, let's make a quick buck out of this thing. Yeah, it's interesting. Uh, the whole, you know, we'll, how will we look back on this whole crypto time? I, I think it will be like the gold rush, people speculating and trying to get rich quick. John says, I turned $60 into tens of thousands with crypto a couple years ago. Well, that's awesome. Did you get to keep it or did it slowly sink back into uh, nothingness? Yeah, did you wait know. a little too long on that one or did you? Because uh, it's like <laughs> yeah. completely opposite of stuff. All about it's, timing. It's, 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 it's uh, yeah. way, way more volatile than uh than just playing the stock market yeah all right let's do some shout outs and some thank yous before we move on to news and then we'll talk to the owner of the largest drag venue or the largest drag club in the united states what about some things going on uh regarding drag performances so we will do that right after the news but first let's talk about uh andreas Twenty dollars thank you so much yeah we had heard of this last week that thank uh you Good luck for your dad. My dad came home Thursday from the hospital, which is awesome. Uh, and then his mom had a heart attack, was revived by EMTs, and is now uh, alive and, and doing well So on uh, Andreas' birthday. So we're glad to hear that everyone survived that. What a rocky road for you. And thank you so much for the donation. And I hope everybody continues to be okay there. Sharon Kidd, 1999 thank Super you, Stickers. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. 
We appreciate that very much. And thank you for all your snow pictures as well. Yeah, the pride of uh, of Willits, California. Pride of Willits, indeed. And we love you. Thank you so much for that. Jim Slayton, four ninety nine. Thank you for that. Thank you we so, appreciate so it. Much. Yes. And then the lady Beatrice really going to town. I've heard of walking in winter wonderland, but given the season, it's ridiculous. It I is do. absolutely. I do. Thank you for the four ninety nine. Another four ninety nine from the lady Beatrice. Mark's murder mystery Mondays are great. Can't wait to see what story I'll be sharing with my true crime loving friends next. I'm not gonna cry. Yeah. I'm not gonna cry. The lady in the fridge. Ooh. And also from the lady Beatrice four ninety nine. Hey Courtney, briefcase and Bailey Sarian has some interesting stories. Might give you some ideas on stuff to talk about. All right, we'll forward that message to Courtney. So thank, thank you, you so much, to everyone, for kicking in. We appreciate it. You uh, can find us at themarkthompsonshow.com. And that is where it's easy to click through with Patreon and PayPal. And we appreciate the YouTube support as well. So thank you for everything you do for us. It's uh, We're very grateful for all the support of The Mark Thompson Show. It's how we're staying in business. Also on the website, by the way, it's getmarkmerch.com. You can find the click through to the merch website as well. And I love getting pictures of people with the Mark Thompson beanies and hats and hydration systems and coffee cups in the snow and whatever else. So thank you for all that. And that is the way to find us, themarkthompsonshow.com. If you want to email us, you can email us at themarkthompsonshow at gmail.com. All right, let's do a little bit of news, Albert. Oh, I just wanted to mention before we get to the news that the sure. Mark the Mark's Madness merch is actually available now. Oh, do we have a picture of the uh, yeah, Mark's Madness hat? Up. Oh, yep. I'm sorry. I was too fast for you. Ooh, the Mark's, Mark's Madness, Madness hat right here. Twenty eight. Uh, okay. Look at that. It's stitched, everybody. This isn't a printed on hat. This is a. Uh, it's nice. Completely embroidered, as they are saying here. And how much is that? Twenty six dollars for the Mark's that's not Madness bad. Hat. And of course, Mark's Madness will be starting sometime next week. I think March fourteenth. So I got to kind of okay. work on that. But okay, it's an exciting time of year, and uh, we'll see which. Uh, which of the drops are popular enough to win. So. But the hat is there and that is up and running. So get it while you can, right? Because it's a limited time only. Yeah, well, there's only one time there's March in this time of season. That's it. So yeah, you got to get it while you can. Absolutely. Thank you for that, Albert. And now let's do some news. There it is. And this report sponsored by tax attorney Steve Moskowitz at 888-TAX-DEAL. Federal Reserve Chairman Jerome Powell be in the hot seat on Capitol Hill, testifying before separate House and Senate panels this week. He's expected to pay, face some pretty tough questioning about the success of the Fed's continued interest rate hikes in fighting inflation. Americans, of course, feeling the pinch as the rates drive uh, up the cost of everything from credit cards to car loans and mortgages. We are all feeling it. Norfolk Southern rolling out new safety measures following its third train derailment in just over a month. Apparently there were three. According to an internal email, the company plans to reduce train length, among other steps. The move coming just 11 hours after a 28-car train jumped the tracks on Saturday in Springfield, Ohio. The word is that one wasn't carrying anything toxic. Time may be running out for TikTok. How clever. A growing number of Republican lawmakers want to give the president the ability to ban the social media site, citing ties to the Chinese Communist Party. The White House ordering all federal agencies to wipe that app from any government devices. Senate leadership says the Washington, D.C. Council chairman cannot withdraw a controversial criminal code bill. A Republican, Republican aide said Congress still expects the vote to happen. The chairman, Phil Mendelson, said he wrote a letter to the Senate trying to take back that legislation from congressional review after realizing the Senate wanted to override it. No can do. And President Biden is vowing to always support the nation's firefighters. While speaking at the International Association of Firefighters Legislative Conference, President told the group he'll always have their back. The major labor organization, the first to endorse Biden's presidential campaign in 2020. And there is a woman in Utah facing felony arson charges after admitting to starting a fire at an apartment complex to burn away negative energy. 
about a dozen units damaged, several residents displaced by this fire Sunday morning near Salt Lake City. Ooh, this woman, a wild idea, <laughs> but it just might work. Crystal Moss was arrested after telling police it was her fault. She just wanted that negative energy, you know, to just... My bad. Away. I'm sorry. <laughs> Meanwhile, people are homeless and all your you belongings know, they do this are... to me all the time. I don't know what the hell they do it for. Fried. Uh, okay, so there is this last story about, uh, uh, also from Utah, about the best grocery bagger. You know, if you're going to do a job, do it well, right? A Utah woman is upholding her company's outstanding record of winning a national competition for grocery store bagging. Carly West won the what? National Grocers Association's Bagging Championship late last month in Las Vegas. She works for Macy's, but not the big retail Macy's. It's spelled differently. That's a Utah grocery chain with five national bagging champions in the last 20 years. Her win got her a nice big old trophy and a grand prize of $10,000. That's not she fake. Is, That's real. Yep. She's a big old bagger. She is. This report sponsored by... Uh, tax attorney Steve Moskowitz for more than 30 years. Steve has put his tax knowledge to work for individuals and for businesses. If you need help with your taxes, please call Steve Moskowitz at 888-TAX-DEAL. You can check him out online at moskowitzllp.com. I'm Kim McAllister on The Mark Thompson Show. Feel it in your soul. The Mark Thompson Show. I'm Kim McAllister in for Mark Thompson. I am so excited to interview this next guest because there's been a lot of talk about different stories that I think are really applicable. And I can't wait to uh, to hear the take of Darcy Drollinger. And I hope I'm saying your name right. I really appreciate you for being here. An actress and owner of the largest drag club in the country. It is Oasis. Hi. Well, hi there. Am I saying, is it Darcy or Darcy? It's it's Darcy. Just Darcy. It's Darcy. Okay, I just want, didn't want to screw it up. <clears throat> so you own Oasis. I appreciate it. I was looking yes. on the website, and you have some of the most f entertaining looking shows coming up that I can't wait to help you promote because they just look hilarious and like so much fun. But before we get into that, I wanted to talk to you about this story that I, I saw. The reason I called you in the first place is because this story came out on Friday out of Tennessee. And I I yeah. think it's related to what's been going on around the country really with uh, drag story time at libraries, right? Where people get all upset and then the conservatives show up and then there's a big protest at the library when all it was was a drag queen reading some kids' books, right? So now Tennessee has gone and taken the step of banning public drag shows. So any drag show that would happen on public property, like a library, would not be allowed. And the governor of Tennessee has signed this bill banning drag shows in public places. And they say it's going to force drag shows underground in Tennessee. So I, I kind of wanted to get your take on this to see if you feel like this is a sentiment that's brewing. Are you feeling any pushback at all here in the city? Um, I mean, we're not feeling a bunch of pushback at the moment. I mean, we I did a thing with Scott Weiner, um, who, who's mm -hmm. our senator. He right. does a pumpkin carving uh, contest every year, and yeah. three drag queens judge it, and I was one of them. And we had <laughs> a we had an anti trans group um, there protesting and running around with cameras filming us in the same vicinity with the kids. And it was, it's so sad because everyone is having a great time except for these people who right. are uh, trying to disrupt it. And I, you know, I wonder if, <clears throat> if ultimately the, the drag thing is still more important for them to come after the trans community, right? Because drag they're, queens you, usually don't walk down the street in drag, but a trans person who someone could say yeah. is in drag could get arrested. I was going to say they're two different things. Just because you are a drag queen performer doesn't mean you're a trans person, right? Well, of course. I mean, they've been right. doing drag since Shakespeare. You know what yeah. I mean? We've, mm -hmm. we've had drag all over TV. Milton Berle. You know, right. was in everyone's home in the 50s and 60s. Flip Wilson. Right. We've got Drag Race. It's a huge, 
huge um, international show. And the fact that they are using this as a hot, you know, the topic, their new it. um, uh, It's a way I feel like it's it's the new like abortion. Right. Mm -hmm. So that that, that topic's old. Let's go after this one. The problem, though, is what it does is they they are calling drag performers groomers. And that is really horrible because what is happening is they're saying you're a pedophile, right? And that's dangerous because you've got people that maybe aren't clear headed believing that rhetoric and then coming and doing some things like shooting up a drag club or like the guy who attacked Nancy Pelosi's husband with a hammer because it's been drilled into him by the far right that Nancy's so terrible. So the same thing with drag performers. If you keep this violent rhetoric going, mm-hmm. somebody is going to um, respond to it in a bad way. I mean, we've had to up yeah. our security four times, you know, it's, uh, and we're, we're in sort of like a bubble here in, in the Bay area. Right. And still, well, and now with this Tennessee no, case, It is, you know, the governor signed the bill. It's a state sanctioned kind of, I would call it state sanctioned bigotry. (laughs) I want us to be the sanctuary city. All drag queens come to San Francisco. (laughs) Um, You're welcome here. Yes. (laughs) Exactly. Or, or we all need to go there. Or how about this? Every ally, every gay person, straight person, everybody, even if you've never cross-dressed before, get in drag. And if everyone, <laughs> thank you, if everyone in Tennessee started, walk, walked out their doors tomorrow in drag, in protest of that, it would be over. But you know what? People aren't. And this is when the drag community who's brought a lot of joy to a lot of people yeah. needs allies. And this is when people need to, to I mean, again, do that one day and it would be over if everyone pulled it together to do that. I, um, I saw that there was a drag show in my area. I live in the North Bay and there is a hotel called the Flamingo and they do this drag show on weekends sometimes. And it's not all the time, but people go to it to the point where it is booked solid. It's really hard to get a ticket. People love it. And so I wonder what's the difference between, you know, sold out drag shows here in California and we're so afraid of it in Tennessee. Yeah. Yeah. Where they're, they're so afraid of it. No, yeah. you know, they're not afraid of guns. No, no, they're not. <laughs> they're, not afraid of, they're not, they're not yeah. afraid of guns, but they're afraid of um, false eyelashes. Are drag you queens know. scary? Should we be afraid? Yeah. Oh my God. <laughs> um, you know what I it, I wish I wish they were maybe if, if drag queens were a little more scary that uh, yeah. people would back off but no I mean the whole job of a drag performer is to you know bring some sparkle into people's lives you know it is um, <clears throat> we are the court jesters in in some respects in that way we are the You know, during the pandemic, you know, we really were the USO show where we're just keeping keeping it going for people and and bringing a little bit of um, of relief in that way. And then this it just it is so maddening to -hmm. see what's happening. And the problem is, like, it's just not going to it's just it, it. you can't go backwards very easily. Like once you've started all of this rhetoric. Yeah. And um, and and calling it unhealthy for children, that like it doesn't just that that aspect doesn't get erased overnight, and no. it is really irresponsible. There are so many more important horrible things that are happening, and to spend so much resource on trying to you know dial us back to like the fifties when it was illegal to cross dress you know i mean that wasn't that long. it was even the 60s right really? like it was the early 60s there were places where you had to have a, you couldn't have more than two articles of clothing that weren't your sex i didn't know that i mean that was 
that was that was where you know i mean people were getting arrested that's where stonewall came from bars yeah. were being raided and if you were wearing clothes that were not your gender's clothes you would go to jail that's really scary so, you know what one yeah. of the things that you brought up was uh the kind of the way that that conservatives tend to be linking drag queens and transgender and at the same time that the governor of tennessee his name is bill lee signed this bill to get rid of drag shows on public property, he signed another bill. And it is a ban on gender affirming health care for youth in the state. So that means, you know, young people, I guess, underage, couldn't have uh, sex changes or even hormone therapy type of situation. So no health care for trans youth. And at the same time, we're going to ban drag shows. So you're right they're they're linking it up, aren't they? I, I see, yeah, very clearly mm -hmm. they're linking it up and, um, you know, making it, <clears throat> yeah, making it as hard as possible, um, you know, for both those things. So again, it is, there are so many more important things that, to, rather than letting these people live their lives. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's, it, and and I love that all of these Republicans want less government, but they'll dictate <laughs> very extreme measures on things that they don't want to have happen. But when it comes to what they want, like their guns, then it is, uh, you know, everyone needs all the freedoms. Uh, let me throw this other story at you, Darcy, because there's a, I don't know if you saw this, but recently the governor of Florida, Ron DeSantis, mm. appointed a, a new board to uh, oversee the area that Disney World is located in, right? Took away the Disney Ooh. board. One of the people that they put on the board apparently is upset because he thinks that tap water could turn people gay. I'm not even making it up. That's <laughs> truly what the man said. Like, I don't oh. know how you put someone overseeing in a, a public entity when they're spouting that kind what? of crazy, crazy craziness. Now, do they have? Do they work for a a bottled a bottled water company or Gatorade? Like, <laughs> like, <laughs> like, is there a reason? Right. Is there is right. there some type um, of monetary benefit? No, he says uh, um, this guy's name is Ron Perry. He's a former pastor from Orlando, so he's got some uh, interesting oh. ideas. He's he once said the number of LGBTQ individuals was increasing because of high estrogen levels in tap water. So because I don't know, we're throwing away our birth control pills down the sink or something that makes the estrogen levels higher, and that makes that's, that's, that's why everyone's gay. Right. So <laughs> um, that is, yeah, that's, that's getting into Marjorie Taylor Greene crazy territory. Absolutely. Um, I, I don't know how these, I don't know how these people get elected and reelected. Um, and again, it feels um, like, yeah, dumb and dumber reality. I don't yeah. know. I don't know. Um, I, I, like, I, 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 it, it's make it makes me speechless, and it terrifies me that more of these people um, keep getting elected. And not only are they wasting our tax dollars, everyone's tax dollars on on stuff like this, but like, it's just a waste of time. Well, this guy was appointed to the know. board by DeSantis, so, so there we have it. That's pretty uh, pretty interesting. I wanted to you yeah, mentioned. Well, yeah. You mentioned you're running a club during the pandemic. So I kind of wanted to roll back to it. And I know this uh, is, you know, off the topic, but how was it running what uh, appears to be the largest drag club in the United States during the pandemic? Did Was that a huge financial hit? Are you guys going to be okay? What were the challenges like for you? It was um, a nightmare. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Just because you know, when you're in, when you are in the... Um, entertainment field our job is to bring people together and entertain mm -hmm. them so when when we make our money from bringing people together into the same room and we can't do that um everything falls apart and we had to you know like every good drag performer if the um <clears throat> dj lo lost your music or the zipper breaks on your outfit you get some duct tape and 
play another song and you, the show must go on. So in that same kind of scrappy attitude, we were like, the show must go on. So mm -hmm. the first thing we did is we created um, something called Meals on Heels, which was a drag delivery service where we would deliver a meal and a curbside drag performance for Oh, people. that's awesome. It was really great. It yeah. was, it brought some sparkle into people's lives. It helped me employ some of my staff and some mm -hmm. drag performers that otherwise weren't making money. We got a lot of good attention um, around that and really helped sort of amplify that message. And that's something we've stopped now, but I'm kind of thinking about bringing it back because it still yeah. was uh, really a lot of fun. We also started a streaming platform so um, people could watch all of our archive videos that we had um, taken over the years well before the closure and then we started um, doing new stuff I was I did a, a weekly media roundup show called hot trash that was pretty popular and and a bunch of other shows and so we again I think our job when we really stepped back and realized our job is to entertain the community and this is mm -hmm. exactly when the community needs it so it's our job to step up and I'm very community minded in what we do mm -hmm. and and it really it was great and even then we got so behind on rent and bills that we were drowning in debt and mm -hmm. I, suddenly it was like, I can't come back from this. So we were going to close and we had oh. an old fashioned tele, we had an old fashioned telethon and um, we did a 12 hour live stream telethon with people performing live and celebrities sending in videos. Yeah. And we had a bank of drag queens on the phone. So you could call and talk to a real live drag queen and donate your money. And we raised $270,000 in 12 hours was incredible and it, made me realize how, it did it mm -hmm. did and it made me realize how important the space is to a lot of people yeah. and you know really gave me the courage to keep going because that was mid you know, march of 20 um 2020 yeah and uh it's uh no 2021 march of 2021 um <clears throat> And uh, it gave me the courage to keep going, and now, and we're here, and we're 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 doing good. You know, there's we're still. I um, it, we're we're. I feel like eighty percent back in terms okay. of people coming out. There sure. are still people that people that don't want to come out. I think the tourism is not as booming as it was four years ago, mm -hmm. but um, little by little. Um, so I've got a how great can team. How can we help you uh, promote things that are upcoming? What do you want to talk? What do you want to tell people that come see at the, the Oasis? Well, you know, we have um, an amazing Saturday night sh um, drag show called Princess, where we bring on a lot of the Rue girls and have some great themes. Tito Soto is the producer of that. And it is um, spectacular. Uh, we also do a monthly uh, show called Reparations, which is an all black drag show hosted by Nikki Jizz, who has also been voted the best drag queen in the Bay Area uh, for um, a number of uh, years in a row. People can get tickets at sfoasis.com. We also do a, a lot of cabarets. Um, in June, we're doing Sex in the City live. Um, so you can see, I play Samantha Jones. Um, I saw some gold, Golden Girls on there too. <laughs> yes, we do. Well, we do Golden Girls in in December. Uh, that's actually at a bigger theater. We do that at Victoria, but every December okay. we do the Golden Girls. And and this October we're doing um, an immersive Rocky Horror experience, oh. where the Rocky Horror show will happen all around you. Okay. Um, which is uh, a lot of fun. And then, you know, we have all different kinds of parties and we have Sunday tea dance for those who want to dance in the afternoon and lots of, lots of um, great events. So we we're, we're pretty much, we're a hybrid space. We are cabaret and theater in the early part of the evening and we turn into a nightclub in the later part of the evening. So fun. I hope people go to it's sfoasis.com. Yes. Right? To go check it out, go see yes. a drag show in the city and thank the ever loving good Lord that we live in the Bay Area or California and not Tennessee <laughs> or Florida. 
Tell right? me about it. Yes, we are in a gorgeous, <laughs> yes, we're in a gorgeous, fabulous bubble and take advantage of it. Yeah. Support local artists, support um, local drag performers. I also started a nonprofit called Oasis Arts and you people can find out about that too. And that's, that mission statement is to really help underwrite the drag performers in the city so um awesome. it's it's a, it's a yeah. beautiful beautiful um i think uh tradition and we need to keep it going I'm so excited to come to the Oasis and check you guys out. Darcy Drollinger, thank you for being here and for talking to me about all the, the current events surrounding drag performances. I appreciate you. Well, thank you so much. Thanks for um, thinking of me and, and inviting me on. Absolutely. I hope you come back on the show sometime. Thank you so much. Me too. Okay. Bye. Bye. -bye. Darcy Drollinger, everybody, from sfoasis.com, the largest drag club in the United States, right here in San Francisco. Okay, so this is the Mark Thompson Show, and Mark should be back in the captain's chair tomorrow. Uh, but I do want to ask you one last time, please, please, oh, please, oh, please, click the like button. Uh, make sure you do that for us. iron rod. Indeed. Smash it, baby. We need all the love we can get. Uh, and thank you for all your, your donations and contributions to the show. I know Kevin Hobbs popped in with a $22.88 uh, contribution. Thank you so much, Kevin Hobbs, and to everyone who has kicked into the show today. Uh, we appreciate it. TheMarkThompsonShow.com. A lot of people upping their Patreon contribution as well. We appreciate that. And we appreciate you being here on The Mark Thompson Show as well. Tomorrow, Mark is back. We've got a lot of good stuff coming up. Albert, what's yeah, we had a lot show? of stuff out of yeah. the airline industry. So we'll probably have a stories from the sky. We'll obviously get to catch up with Mark. We haven't talked to yeah. Mark in a while. So I talked to him last kinda... night. He's doing okay. So things are going all right. Yeah. And it's fun to see if you don't follow Mark on, on Instagram, you should follow him because he's just looking, going through all the old stuff in his house. Oh. So it's like, oh, this is. This appliance is from my mom uses this from the 1960s, basically, and it's uh, <laughs> very, very entertaining. But we'll we'll get a we'll get a mark uh, a mark update. Obviously, he's gonna be back, and then we have awesome. uh, our usual Tuesday guest, David K. Johnston, which is oh, always one of our more popular segments, and it's always nice to check in. I feel like he always recenters us from everything that's going on. He knows yep. everything, and he know, has an idea and an opinion on everything. And uh, it all kind of makes sense. You know, we have uh, it does. Yeah. such a great so, treat on Tuesdays with him. So we're back to normal tomorrow. And we thank you for being here today. Truly uh, very grateful for that. And I will see you again tomorrow. We'll also see you in just a moment on the Nikki Maduro show, where at uh, noon, just a minute away or two, she'll talk about Governor DeSantis in Florida making a pit stop here in California for a little visit. Uh, Trump weighing in on Tiny D. That'll be interesting. A new ATM scam called Glue and Tap. I have no idea what that yeah, is. Yeah, I saw that over the weekend. You, oh. you know, you think that the contactless, you don't have to insert a card. You just tap your card. It's there's it's a new, they're adapting, Kim. It's getting scary out there. Oh, they're going to find all kinds of ways to take your money from you. The mayor of New York wants businesses to have a no mask policy. None at all. Like not even if you want to, right? And Chris Rock fully addresses the slap. That and more on the Nikki Maduro show. We'll put the link in the, the chat there. Hope you follow us over the show for uh, Nikki Maduro is from noon to two. And and we hope you'll join us and again here on the Mark Thompson Show tomorrow at 10. Thank you, everybody. And as Mark always says, bye-bye.